This video is sponsored by NordVPN. NordVPN is a virtual private network service provider that protects your identity online by encrypting your internet traffic whether you're operating from the airport or a hotel or anywhere. We'll talk more about NordVPN at the end of this video, but for now, let's get into it and take a look at Marcus Aurelius's Three Rules of Life. Marcus Aurelius says, Waste no more time arguing about what a good man should be. Be one. Aurelius was the emperor of Rome during the 2nd century AD and is said to be the last in a line of five good emperors known to have ruled Rome. Under his leadership, the empire was guided by virtue and wisdom. He was a student of Stoicism, a philosophy that emphasized fate, reason, and self-restraint. While influenced by many philosophers and philosophical texts, Aurelius's primary influence was the teachings of the former slave and Stoic philosopher Epictetus. During his rule, the emperor constructed a series of autobiographical writings now known as the Meditations. While the Meditations was never intended for publication, it remains in print to this day and is perhaps as popular as ever. The journal shows that the most powerful man on the planet was going through the same problems that we deal with today, and indeed the same problems we will be grappling with tomorrow. So join us now as we examine the three rules of life that Marcus Aurelius thought were of the utmost importance to living a good life, and how we can adapt them to work with our modern day lives. Rule number one, always aim for pure judgment of events. In book four of the Meditations, Marcus Aurelius tells us, suppress the value judgment, which you add, and the I've been hurt is also suppressed. Suppress the I've been hurt, and the harm is suppressed. This rule is influenced by Epictetus's discipline of assent, which involves making correct judgments about your impressions, that is, the nature of the external world and events that occur in it. Aurelius explains that we make judgments about everything, but instead of making a pure judgment, we make value judgments by adding a personal twist to our consideration. Imagine that you're out driving one day and another car drives out of a turning directly in front of you, coming dangerously close and almost hitting your car. Your instincts take over and you swerve hard in order to avoid a collision. What often happens next is that you'll start cursing at the other driver, making rude gestures and generally losing your cool. Now, there are emotions at play here at different points. First, your emotions alerted you to danger and you reacted quickly in order to avoid it. This is the correct use of emotions. However, what happened next, right after you managed to avoid the accident, is that other emotions took over and made you angry. This is the incorrect use of emotions. What is the use of being angry at this point? The danger to your life has passed. The only thing that you're doing is venting your frustration, which not only serves no purpose, but could even be counterproductive as it makes you more agitated and prone to an accident. When something bad happens to us, we say so-and-so happened to me and that hurt me. And in this case, we would say I could have died. The last part that is, and that hurt me, or I could have died, is the value judgment part. So when you remove the last part, you don't let the bad thing make an impact on you. For the Stoics, the biggest part of living according to nature was using your head. We need to try to stop adding one's own personal twists to our own judgments and instead use rational thinking and our ability to reason in order to grant or deny assent to those impressions. So how do we reason and make correct judgments? We do this by following what the ancient Stoics did 2000 years ago, which was using their ability to reason. In the modern world, this practice is known as cognitive distancing. Cognitive distancing, being the main precursor of cognitive behavioral therapy, or CBT, is basically the ability to become aware of our own beliefs and assumptions and to distance them from external events. As an example of cognitive practices, consider the simple ABC model from CBT, which is adversity, belief, and consequences. Imagine you just got fired from your job. 
The adversity here is getting fired. The belief is how we represent and or explain that event. In this case, we may believe that we're useless or worry about the mortgage or other future uncertainties. The consequences are the behavior or feelings that are caused by the belief. Perhaps we feel sadness or anger. When you make a judgment like that and give meaning to events, you're not making a pure judgment. So remember to look at everything that happens to you for what it is. To apply this discipline of judgment, we need to inquire whether your beliefs are justified. Suppose that after being fired from your job, you had the thought that you're worthless, you'll never find another job and you'll eventually lose your house. Is the fact that getting fired really strong evidence that you're worthless or that you'll not find another job in the future? Of course not. Of course there are other jobs available and in time, if you work on yourself, you might well get something better than what you left. This can be further reinforced by non-cognitive practices. As an example of non-cognitive practice, consider mindfulness meditation. In meditation, you exclusively pay attention to your thoughts and nothing but them as they come and go. The insight that you are not your thoughts. You can note just how different the beliefs and associated feelings of getting fired are from getting fired because you're worthless. It is one thing to believe these things. It is another to build a strong intuition for it. By using this approach, as Marcus Aurelius would refer to it, we are suspending certain value judgments from external events to avoid negative emotions like worry, anger, and so on. Did your partner cheat on you? Did you lose money? Did people make fun of you? Did something happen? Then do something or move on. The events themselves can't hurt you if you don't let them. And hence, we should aim for pure judgments of events. Rule number two, only desire what's inside your control. In the seventh book of his meditations, Aurelius writes, love only the event which comes upon us and which is linked to us by destiny. This rule is influenced by Epictetus's discipline of desire. Stoics believed that there are four passions that hinder our progress and contribute to our misery. They divided the four passions into two types. One for things not in present possession or anticipated in the future, which are desire, and two for things presently engaging a person, which are pleasure and distress. Here, in this rule, we will be focusing on the passion of desire. Marcus Aurelius only desired what was inside his control or what happened to him. In his meditations, he continuously repeats to himself that most things in life are outside of his control. He realized that life is unpredictable. In 2000 years, nothing has changed about that. We often desire the things we do not control, like more money, a better job, a bigger house, a massive social media following, or maybe that our partner will always love us, that we always have the loyalty of our friends. We sit around waiting, hoping, begging, craving, wishing for luck to strike or change to happen while we maintain the exact same social circle and habits we've always had. We always want a better job with better pay, but we hold ourselves from learning any new skills that might actually get us the job that we desire. We could either waste our time and energy into praying and hoping that things would change or we can concentrate on what's in our control and start taking action. We need to be self-reliant and take responsibility for ourselves, not leaving it to the gods or the whims of fortune to determine whether we get what we want. Marcus Aurelius tells us that if we wish to progress in life, then we should limit our desires to only what's in our control, like taking deliberate action and not to pin our hopes on uncertainties. Desire is, I really want this car and once I get it, I'll be happy. While deliberate action is, if I want this car, then I have to raise the cash. And to do that, I must put extra hours and effort into learning new skills and working hard to realize those funds. Whatever you want or wish to accomplish, it will require your deliberation and consideration, not desire. 
Even then, if you work hard and do everything that you're required to do, and still fall short of cash or for some other reason if you don't get that car, then instead of feeling bad, you should accept it gracefully. Stoics believe that the outcomes, whatever they may be, are not in our control. So instead of getting angry or reacting in an unhealthy manner when things don't turn out the way you want, you should love and accept it however it turns out. Most things in life that happen are not up to you, so only desire what's inside your control and accept whatever that is not. Rule number three, act for the common good. In book 12 of his meditations, we learn from Marcus Aurelius that, in the first place, nothing at random and nothing unrelated to some goal or end. Second, don't relate your actions to anything except an end goal which serves the human community. This rule is influenced by Epictetus's discipline of action. The discipline of action is about taking the right actions for the right reasons. It's about what you should do. Marcus Aurelius was a man of action and reminds us that we need to remove impulses from our life and make our actions purposeful. You probably have several roles that you play in real life. These might be tied to your family, your job or your personal pursuits. Stoics believe that we are here for a reason, which is to make things better. So make a list and then think about what you want to achieve by playing each of these roles and what duties stem from this. The list of these roles should form your purpose for now and for the future. Having a purpose is the basis of intrinsic motivation. This type of motivation has been shown to be the key to your ability to achieve your goals. Aurelius wants us to keep a bigger picture in mind, which is to serve the common good. As humans, we live to help one another, including people who are selfish, meddlers, liars, treacherous, envious and unsociable. Nature designed humans as social animals with innate moral instincts that allow us to live in groups. To act otherwise, to live like an animal, is against human nature and irrational. Our society is the glue which holds us together, and since we're part of the wider world, our actions reflect our place in it. Hence, our actions should always have an ethical purpose in mind. Let's take the example of lying. If you lie, this will reflect on you. People will no longer trust you, and that can have an impact on how they treat you in future. Even if you're not caught, there will still be consequences at other people's expense. One bad choice can destroy your character, so be careful what you do. Good and evil are the results of actions taken based on choices specific people made. Each action you take will reflect on you and your character. So, as Marcus Aurelius would say, don't talk about being a good man, just be one. As we said at the beginning, this video is sponsored by NordVPN. Usually, whenever you access the internet, your internet service provider takes you to the website you want to visit. This means internet service providers can see and save everything that you do online. They may even sell your information to the government, advertisers and other third parties. The risk of your information getting out only increases once you log on to any public hotspot, either in hotels, cafes or at airports, since anyone with basic hacking skills could access your sensitive information like passwords, banking details, credit card numbers and any other private details every time you put them online. And here's where NordVPN comes into play. NordVPN hides your IP address and encrypts all the data you send or receive by tunneling your internet traffic through a specially configured remote server. The encrypted data then looks like gibberish to anyone who intercepts it. It's completely impossible to read. All of us here at Philosophies for Life use NordVPN. The app makes using a VPN super easy. Nord has over 5,500 superfast servers in 60 countries. This means you can watch whatever you want regardless of your region. You can save your favorite servers and depending on your usability, you can have up to six simultaneous connections. Click on the link below in the description and use our promo code to get a massive 70% off plus one month free on NordVPN's membership. 
Take the first step to protecting your online privacy by clicking on the link in the description. If you enjoyed this video, please do make sure to check out our full Stoicism playlist. And for more videos to help you find success and happiness using ancient philosophical wisdom, don't forget to subscribe. Thanks so much for watching.